We have been going, you can open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, and we have been studying from the New Testament, the four Gospels, the personal testimonies of those who were healed under the ministry of Jesus, individuals. And uh, we found out that there are 19 individuals. We know there were many more not healed, but we only have the record of 19 in these four Gospels. You think there are more than that because many times Matthew and Mark and Luke would all record the same instance. For instance, the one we're going to read about today, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record it, but it's just the same one, you see. And uh, I want to back up a little bit. We've covered this, and I, I, didn't, I wanted to go into some detailed teaching. And so I want to back up today to one of them we talked about in this fifth chapter of Mark, and that is the woman who touched his garment, or the woman with the issue of blood. And uh, I wanted to, uh, not only uh, about her, but then another one here at the beginning, uh, the, the, the maniac of Gadara, or the, we call him the madman sometimes, or the demoniac. So let's start reading with the very first verse here, because see, it's all in this chapter. And also the healing, raising from the dead and healing of Jairus' son. All three of these are in this chapter. And we looked at them, you know. But I want to back up to this chapter and look at it a little bit more in, in some detail. Now, and they came over unto the other side of the sea. We begin to read the very first verse now of the fifth chapter of Mark. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, that's the Sea of Galilee, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thy torment me not. For he said unto him, that is, Jesus had said unto the man, Come out of the man, or to the spirit rather, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? That is, Jesus asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000. And were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name, 
And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue, King James said virtue, actually the Greek says power, and some King James translation in the margin to let you know that, power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the root of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Praise God. And he suffered no men to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel are not dead, but sleepeth. They laughed him to scorn. And so you could go on reading. We'll not take time necessarily, but she was raised up from the dead and healed because if she hadn't been healed, you know, she would have died again immediately. Amen. And uh, so these three, uh, Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead and healed, the woman who touched his clothes, and this uh, man of Gadara who was demonic, are all linked together, you noticed. Jesus went across the sea here to, that's the Sea of Galilee, to this country of the Gadarenes, and we read that story. As he came back across the Sea of Galilee, at, uh, he, he landed there at Capernaum, and that's where uh, Jairus met him and besought him greatly to come, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. And he was on his way to his house when the woman with the issue of blood touched him. And then we read where he went on there to the house, and the damsel rose and and was healed, and he said to them, she's about 12 years of age, he said to them, you know, to give, that they should give her something to eat. So all these three are linked together. Now, I wanted us, as, as I said, we have covered them in our lessons. There, there are uh, many things involved here that's uh, a little deeper than just skimming along the surface, you know. We'll go over some things that we said, first of all, for the benefit of you who have not been with us when we did cover this. We'll go over the ground we've covered, and then we'll We'll get into detail what we want to discuss. Now, uh, this madman, or this Gadarene demoniac, there's, there seems no reason at all to doubt that cases of insanity and diseases of the mind are still the same in character and in cause as they were in the days of Jesus. And uh, we see, of course, that in his day, as this case was, a, a matter of demon activity. I made mention of the fact in our discussion that uh, on one occasion as we ministered to the uh, sister of a lady that had been raised up from the dead, or that is from a deathbed, she's virtually dead under our ministry, and she had asked us to pray for her sister who was an inmate of the asylum down in Texas in Wichita Falls, and so we said, well, we'll pray. We she said, you can't get in there to minister to her, but I don't know how God could do it, but he, some way or another he can get in where we can minister to her. And so God did get her out on a two-week furlough, and we cast the devil out of her, and she was completely healed, and they never 
she never spent any more time in the asylum. Now, she had to go back because she was just out on par parole, but the same psychiatrist that said her mind would never be right, she'd always need institutional care, pronounced her well after they ran their test, normal. Uh, but this sister, I asked her, uh, you, you learn a lot by inquiring, you know. You know, a lot of times I think we go along, things happen, you know, and we never stop to inquire. Well, why did that happen? How did that happen? I mean, in the spiritual realm, just like it does in the natural, uh, because you can learn. Uh, and so her sister said, I asked the, uh, the doctor, who was also superintendent of the state institution that we was talking about, uh, is this peculiar to my sister? See, she thought that she had committed the unpardonable sin. In fact, you begin to talk to her about, uh, uh, because before she lost her mind, she was at work in the Christian things, you know, knew the Bible and so on. You begin to talk to her about those things, she'd begin to scream, pull her hair in her eyes, just like they sh looked like they shot fire. And she'd begin to scream, oh, no, 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 I can't be saved, I can't be saved, I've committed unpardonable sin. So this lady said, I asked the superintendent, who was also a doctor, uh, a medical doctor as well as a psychiatrist, uh, if this is peculiar, con you know, concerning my sister, and he, he said, oh, no, no. He said, 90% of them in here all say the same thing. Well, I think readily that you could see that then there's some demon activity involved. That either the devil is the cause of the whole situation, or else he's taking advantage of the weakness of the mentality of individuals to dominate them. And so we can see that uh, according to this scripture and others that we've looked at, that the disorders in this man were distinctly attributed by our Lord Jesus Christ to satanic agency. And then another thought that we discussed and looked at, and I think we, you know, how many were not with us when we went over this? Well, a good many of you. So we'll look at it again. I think we need to realize, and it'll give you some, may make you shudder, but to give you some idea about some of these things, the power that held this man was sufficient to destroy a great, a great herd of swine. The power that held this one man was sufficient to destroy 2,000 head of swine. Isn't that right? What fearful forces one human being can hold Then the power, think about the power which this evil spirit exerted upon that man's body. The Bible says that he broke every chain that they bound him with. I mean, they couldn't find a chain stronger to bind him with what he couldn't break. Chains, fetters, any chain and every chain that the hand the man could find to place upon him, our fetter endeavored to bind him he broke them asunder, it said. Think about what power. This is a spiritual influence. Evil. Demons. But think about what effect it had upon his physical being. Think about that. That'll give you some idea of how evil agencies are, let's put it another way, this, this divide both good and evil. Spiritual agencies may affect either for good or evil. Spiritual agencies may affect us even physically for good or for evil. Now you see, this was the power of the devil that made this man so strong he could break into chain. Now in the Old Testament, the power of God for good came on Samson. He broke the fetters asunder, and so on and so forth. How can you tell, you see? Sometimes, you see, the physical effect of spiritual forces is so very similar. Are you listening to me? But how can you tell? Well, praise God, this power drove that man out of his mind. The power that Samson was operating under didn't drive him out of his mind. He had all of his physical faculties and mental faculties. Amen. This man, you see, could break through the power of these evil spiritual forces, any chain or fetter that bound him, but that same power drove him to tear all of his clothes off of him and wander naked out in the tombs, crying night and day, 
cutting himself with stones. But you see, Samson operating under the Spirit of God. You know, you remember there's a text there in the New Testament in 2 Timothy 1, 6, 7, somewhere along there where it said, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Notice Samson, by the effect of spiritual power that came on him, was able to do mighty feats, feats of physical strength, but his mind remained sound. He didn't tear his clothes off, wander around naked, cry out, cut himself with stones. Very discernible, the difference, isn't it? I said, isn't it? And so it is that oftentimes, you see, uh, evil power and, 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 and good power, so to speak, may, do, may produce seemingly similar results. One of them is for good and one of them is for evil. Are oh, you listening to me? All physical strength, I made this statement, I want to make it again. All physical strength is spiritual in its cause. All physical strength is spiritual in its cause. That's something I wish we could go into detail. We're not right now, but later on I think we will. Now then, here's something else we need to see. This wretched man seems to have been conscious of two principles within him. One, his own will. His own will feebly struggling for freedom. The other, the evil spirits controlling him and crushing his will under them. Now there is a vast difference, and we should see it, such a case as this where his own will is feebly struggling for freedom. There's a vast difference between, and yet crushed under evil power, between that and a person willingly yielded to Satan. The difference between the two is very great. During the convention, you know, when Dr. Sumball was here at the beginning, he spoke, and then the second morning, of course, what, there's supposed to be ministers and their wives or Christian workers there. But he dealt at length sometime about this particular subject. And he made mention of the fact of, uh, you know, we know very little really about demon power in this country. We have some of it, and it's, uh, it's, it's gaining momentum among the occult and so on. But in other countries where the devil is stronger, of course, you, you have more manifestation. And Dr. Sumrall was there in the Philippines, you know, back in the 50s, and he built a, a strong church there. In fact, they, there in Manila, they, they have about 3,500 members or in attendance on Sunday. Uh, but the great revival came to the Philippines. You know, he was struggling along, not doing too much, and there was a young lady there that was uh, in prison. Doctors, you know, they put it right on TV. They were, the psychiatrists were treating her, see? But she would see a, a, an evil spirit, look like a great big ape or baboon, and it would bite her. Nobody else could see her. She's in a prison cell, and yet the doctors could find these marks on her where it looked like some animal had bit her. Historical fact. Well, God told Brother Sumrall to go down there and minister to it, see, and actually he, uh, he cast the devil out of her and delivered her. As a result of that, well, then, you know, why he had the, the, the president of the Philippines invited him in. He had conference him. Anything you want yours? He said, well, I want the city park here for a meeting. He wrote it out for him, gave it to him. He could get nearly anything he wanted. They put it right on TV, you see. And then, then after these years, a woman has grown, married. Well, of course, she's a grown girl then. But an older woman, children, uh, and Christian, and, 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 and never had another attack he's been in contact with. But now, you see, this... Uh, this uh, 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 you know, she would just, there in the cell, they'd watch her, the psychiatrists, the doctors, others, newspaper people. And she'd act like she's fighting somebody. They can't see anybody. They can't actually see anything. She's just like she's a fighting somebody. She can see it, but they can see this where the thing bit her, and there's nobody in there. She's bleeding. There's tooth marks deep, half an inch deep into her. You know, you can't deny that. Say, well, how can the devil manifest himself? Well, the devil can manifest himself just like God can manifest himself, where he's more in control and the power is more, his power is more real, well, then he has more manifestation. Now, 
You know, here at the school, uh, and I don't know whether he'll be back this year or not, he will if he comes in at the time, but Brother Ernie Reb from, from the Philippines. And Brother Reb uh, is, uh, has been there for 25 years. Built over 300 churches. And some of our graduates from Rhema are there working in some areas with him, and so on and so forth, and other areas of the Philippines as well. And Brother Reb said to me as we were talking, he said, uh, and I, I, I've known Brother Reb actually, I knew him 25 years ago before he ever went to the Philippines as a minister and evangelist here in America. And at one time, he pastored Faith Tabernacle. It used to be down there. It's called Faith Assembly now over on 21st Street, but Faith Tabernacle, old Faith Tabernacle here in Tulsa for a couple of years. And, and so, uh, you know, I say all that to you, so, you know, because people sometimes, you know, I mean, even supposedly, uh, what gets me is somebody that thinks they're so smart and just by what they say, just got through telling them, I'm ignorant, I'm stupid, I don't know a thing about the Bible, been preaching for 30 years, I don't know anything about the Bible. They might as well say it, every intelligent person knows it. Because people say, well, I've been preaching I've seen in my life. People think such things as that could happen. Brother Reb moved to another island there in the Philippines. You see, you've you got to realize, you know, once you get out of Manila, it may be modern, but brother, you're, <laughs> you're over 100 years back from where we are. No electricity, and 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 so on, and, and there's seven thousand islands there, and uh, so he moved on to one of the islands, actually that's supposed to be uh, the very stronghold of Satan. But he's not afraid. He said, "Don't come to the Philippines." He told the students, those that wanted, to, you know, he met with some of them uh, that was interested, and he told him, "said Don't come." Unless you can cast out devils and minister to the sick, well, you're wasting your time. And so uh, here he's building a house, building a home on this island where he's going to live. Well, Brother Reb told me, you know, you can, you can get a, a good carpenter's, you see, it's hard for us to realize, but you can get good carpenters for 50 cents a day. I mean top carpenters. And so he said, uh, they're building this house. And he showed me a picture of a very lovely home. I mean, but while they were building, see, this had happened in the past. While they were building, he showed me the picture of a completion of a beautiful home. One of these carpenters on one side of the house was, you know, the way the land fell off, you know. It was up maybe three feet off of the ground on one corner, you know. And, you know, the underpinning hasn't been put around yet. He's under there working on something, you see. And he said, this fellow just started to holler. And Brother Reb told me, you see, I run around there and see what it was, and he's wrestling around there like he's wrestling with something. And I can't see anything except him just rolling all over, rolled out from under the house, rolled down, you know, because, you know, the land slanted away, you know, rolled off down there like he's wrestling. A couple of fellas, you know, wrestling, roll over and over, you know. And I can't see anything except uh, the man, all he can see. But the man's yelling, get him off of me, get him off of me. And Brother Reb said, I saw See, no, I can't see anything other, otherwise, but I saw something just rip his britches leg, pants leg. And, and, and it looked like some teeth mark just ripped his leg till it just started bleeding from one end from his hip down. Just ripped it, you know. And he's hollering, get it off of me. He said, then I realized them. And I ran up there and said, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You leave him. Get, this is my property. This is my property here. You've got no right on my property. The thing ran off and left. He never did see him. The other men saw him. But he wouldn't come back to work then, you see. Now, that the other carpenters, you see, that he hired, they are not saved people, you see. He just hired them to build his house. He's moving into a new territory, actually. They, they, they wouldn't come. They're afraid. Because this jumped on him. And he jumped on him because, see, he's working for a Christian, you see. Well, the witch doctor came. And he wants to sacrifice there, you see, on, on his property. He wants to sacrifice a pig and a chicken. Sacrifice their blood. To, you know, to appease the demons. Brother Reb said, I said, no, you don't come on my property. Well, yeah, but he said that, that you know, I've, I've got to appease these evil spirits, you see. So the, and, and, and that pig's a whole month's salary. A whole month's salary. I've got to sacrifice. No, he said, you don't sacrifice anything on my property. This is my property. 
He said, yeah, well, yes, but now... He, well, he said, no, no, they don't know evil spirits. I forbid them to come back. They won't come back on my property. They don't set foot on my ground. Tell the carpenter to come on back. That won't happen to him again. I forbid them to come on my property. In the name of Jesus. I see those demons in you, Brother Red. In the New Testament, you remember... Remember those seven sons of Seba? They said about to cast out some devils. They said, we a Jew there in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Come out of him. Well, he said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. Who are you? They weren't Christians. They didn't have a right to the use of the name of Jesus. But see, Jesus knew brother, uh, the demons knew Brother Reb. They, the devils know you. They sat around and laugh at you because you don't exercise your authority. Amen. And so the witch doctor said, well, now you'll be responsible. He said, now, you know, said, eh, if he comes back to work, that devil jumps on him and kills him. He said, if he hadn't got him off of him, he'd probably killed him. He said, then that man's got a wife and several children. He said, you'll have to take care of him because you'll be responsible. He said, and I said, tell him, come on back. They won't attack him anymore. I forbid them to come on my property just like I do you. Don't you set foot on this property. You're not act offering any sacrifices to the devil any blood to the devil or any kind of sacrifice on my property in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, the man came on back. Eventually, he's off for quite a while. It took a while for his leg. He couldn't even walk on it. He healed up. He came on back and there wasn't attacked anymore. I found even my own experience with people who are troubled with demons and even, even with, with unsaved people sometimes troubled that they, they'll not act up as long as they're in my presence. They know I've got authority over them. And, and much of the time, they will not act up. If they do, uh, we tend to them. I guarantee you the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has more authority than we've ever realized yet. Or ever used. I said, or ever realized, or used. Praise God forevermore. Can you say amen? amen. Now, now, you know, a lot of good people, bless heart, you feel so sorry for them for supposed to be so intelligent and you know they're so ignorant. A lot of good people, I've heard them laugh about this story of Brother Summerall's. I mean, full of gospel, born again, full of gospel preachers. I just walked off and left, and I didn't want to be around such ignorance, afraid some of that stinking stuff might get off on me. Just walked off and left them. Just walked off and left them. Remember, the Bible said, let him that's ignorant be ignorant still. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, I, I, uh, you know, we're not magnifying the devil, but we really need to know our enemy. You see, you, you, you've got, you, you run into two difficulties here if you're not careful. You see, you know, people think that, well, I've got to walk in faith, you know, and to acknowledge something that's wrong is not walking in faith. That's not right. That's not right. You know, you've got to acknowledge facts and things that are real. Amen. You know, like a couple of fellas I know down in East Texas years ago, and you still see people foolish, that way, fool, acting foolish instead of, and presumption instead of faith. Two preachers. Two full gospel preachers. Now, one of them was what we call a lay preacher. He had a little farm that he ran, and he'd preach wherever he could the door. The other was an evangelist. They came to my church. Neither one of them was a member of my church, but they came and visited. And the, the one that was a lay preacher, his whole family sang. Usually, if they came, we'd have them sing. Usually, there's air every Sunday night. Once in a while, he's all preached somewhere, and, and they were good singers, and they would bless you with the singing. But these were depression days, you know, way back in the 30s, and no, no money much. So they decided to make a little extra money. So they went down to, to uh, Suffer Spring, Texas. In those days, there was a handle factory there. You know, they'd make axe handle, hoe handle, and all kind of handles, you know, shovel handles and hammer handles and all kinds. And so they brought them a pickup load of handles. You could buy $50 worth in those days, and man, this, you know, it'd be like a lot of money today, you know. It don't sound big then, but that's all. That's their total assets. And they come in real late to this farmhouse, and the two of them got in late, so they slept in the same bed in the front bedroom. And in that time, they was awake, and it was raining. I mean, just pouring down the rain. One of them said, Brother, we ought to get up and get those handles in or else cover them up, you know, with a tarp. Because, you know, if they get wet and then the sun comes out in the morning and signs on their warp, then they've lost all their money. The other said, oh, God will take care of it. God will take care of it. Well, God didn't take care of it. It rained on them. The sun, they slept till 10 and they already got up. Well, of course, it's up late. The sun shined on them and it warped all their handles and they lost the whole thing and all their money's gone. And then they come along and ask you, you know, you're a faith preacher. You ought to have the answer. How come that didn't work? I said, because you're stupid. <laughs> That's why it didn't work. Because you're stupid. Amen. I said, amen. amen. I was just thinking something funny. I'd tell you if I had, well, I don't know whether I should or not. 
<laughs> Amen. You know, uh, God expects you to do for yourself what you know to do. Those fellows already got up and all they had to do, they had a tarp that covered the back end thing and just put this tarp over it. Wouldn't have taken a few seconds, a few minutes at the most. They'd have their handles all covered up and in the dry, nice and fine. They wouldn't have lost their money. And for them to lose that much money, it don't sound big, lose $50 that my man. But man, it'd be like $500 now to most folks, or even more. You see? And, and, and you know, you're, you're a, you're a uh, God expects you to have some, to use what brains you have if you got any. And he'll sort of take care of those who don't have many brains. That's the reason he's watching that promote you. <laughs> or us, or somebody. <laughs> because we all act foolishly sometimes, haven't we? Anybody here never has acted foolishly? <laughs> well, I don't hardly think so. Uh, we've all been in that boat, but we don't, we're not that foolish at least. Uh, I, at least we're willing to admit it that we missed it. I remember one time uh, I told you something funny, you know, and it, it don't hurt, you know. It's a true story. Turned out all right, but I remember uh, uh, we were attending the convention. 1947, last church I pastored. Five of we ministers all got together and drove. Uh, one of them had got a new car. New car, see, 47. See, the war was over, and just a few new cars were trinkling out, and you had to sign up for him, you know, and he helped to get signed up. And he got him a brand new car, only one of them that had a brand new car. So the rest of us all bought his gasoline, you know. We all divided up. We, we paid all the gasoline expense, you know, and used his car. Five of us went to a convention in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, uh, right at the end of August, first part of September of 1947. And, 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 and Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, no bigger than it is, it's, you know, it wasn't, they didn't have enough hotel space and all for everybody. So they asked people, not only of the churches of the full gospel group, but, but anybody just advertised the city. The Chamber of Commerce asked the people to open up their homes. You know, we'd pay them for it. And, and so we stayed, three of us stayed in one home. This dear lady was not full gospel. I believe she was Lutheran, but she's a very splendid lady, a fine lady. And we, we stayed in her home, and, 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 and we paid her, you know. And she just, you know, didn't want, just maybe what, what it cost, $3 a night, I think, something like that. You know. And so... We would get in late and serve because after services, you know, we'd eat and fellowship with other preachers, and you know how that goes. Sometimes you're midnight, sometimes you're one o'clock in the morning getting in. She'd go on to bed, you see, and so she just gave us a key and said, "Y'all just come and go as you want," you know. And and, and then on uh, on uh, towards the as we got down towards the weekend, it didn't close till on Saturday actually. And and she was going out of town, you see, on Friday and Saturday, and be back on Sunday actually. Actually, I believe we did close on some with the Sunday afternoon service, and and so uh, uh, so one of the one of the preachers, well, the older one of the group. Now I was uh, well, twenty eight years old. Uh, uh, one of them was forty seven, I think. So we he was older. So we elected that he should you know carry the key. Well, we got back out there about one o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, Actually, we, you know, the other fellow had the car in another place, so we just got a taxi and came back out there in the house. See, the taxi went on. We just, we were left there. And, and, and he got to feeling around for the key, and he said, oh, boys, my God. Man, he said, I, I forgot I left that key. I changed clothes between the afternoon service, and that key is in one of my other suits pants pocket laying on the bed up there. And so uh, I just went over. I thought, well, boy, we're here. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. Got in the porch swing, you know, and sort of stretched out, you know, and, <laughs> and and he said uh, he kept ringing the bell nobody answered see and I remembered this lady said she's going to be out of town see and kept ringing the bell nobody answered and finally the other fellow said well you know Mrs. So and so's not there there's nobody here there's no way to get in because she sa he said she's gone for the weekend well this fellow felt bad before the seven he said men come on here now pray with me I just te teased him reading joke he said let's just pray God will open the door Well, I said to him, uh, you know, uh, actually, see, it was summertime, you know, and we had no air conditioning, 47, you know, and the windows are open, the screen there, but the windows are open in, the, in our room, particularly where we were, our part of the house, you know. And I said, why don't you just tell him to throw your britches down? He's got the key in it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's upstairs. It'd be nearer than coming all the way down the stairs to open the door. I said, oh, this is serious. Don't be a joke in a time like this. <laughs> don't be a joke in a time like this. Come on now, said to agree with us that God will come down and open that door. Well, 
I said, just have him to get your britches or the key out and throw it down. What's the difference in getting the key and throwing it down here to us and coming all, why have him to walk all the way down the steps? That'll be near to, oh, come on, quit joking now. This is serious. <laughs> we got to laughing there one between one, one thirty, well, about one thirty in the morning. <laughs> Well, bless God, you boy, do I know that. I'm going to pray God to unlock the door. I said, well, go ahead and pray he'll unlock the door. So he prayed, but God never did. And some way or another, she fit to come down and unlock that door. It stayed locked. <laughs> well, I said, I've got the porch swing. You fellas just lay down on the porch to just sleep. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we said, well, now, this window's open. This end of the house is open. Why not uh, the, uh, the other fellow said, you know what? Uh, I imagine this whole side of the house open because uh, the bathroom that we use on this end of the house and those windows are open. And he said, I noticed I was there that 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 uh, that window's up and the screen's unlocked. He said, Why don't we, why don't we just go around the back there and see if there's any way to get up there? So we host, host there's a garage there, and the other two of us just just lifted him up on that garage scene, and he stepped over on the edge of the part of the roof that came off there and just opened the window, and went in, come down and unlocked it. See, God was waiting for us to use her head. Now, you could have been standing there yet. Now, I realize under some extreme emergency, if there's no other way, God may come down and open the door. Amen. Are you listening to me? But you see, God was waiting for us, and I think a lot of times God's waiting for us to use our heads. You still out there? You're going home. You know, I think full of gospel people a lot of times have just about used everything else except their head. And you go to talking about your head, and you're talking about your mind. Some people said, well, that's all like Christian science, isn't it? <laughs> no, no. Much different between what we're preaching Christian science is, is between daylight and dark. And like one doctor here in Tulsa said, it's not Christian science, it's Christian sense. Praise God. Can you say amen? amen? Now, there's a great deal of difference, and you need to see the difference. In such a case as this Gadarene demoniac, and a person willingly yielded to Satan, the difference between the two is very great. There's another thought that, that Dr. Summerall brought out that I started to bring out and didn't get to, but I'm getting to now. Even in this extreme case of this woman, that girl, actually, she's a grown girl, that was in prison there, you know, because of her, her well, just a demoniac, we could say. And that's the only way they could hold her was in, those, in that jail cell. And uh, after she was delivered, Brother Summerall said, I questioned her carefully. And I asked her, I said, now, was there any time that you ever refused to yield to this or, or something that this spirit wanted you to do that you wouldn't do? She said, oh, yeah. And she mentioned time or two some things that he wanted to do. Incidentally, the minute that Dr. Summerall went down there, because God told him to, and they let him in when he told him, told the authorities, God told him to come down and cast the devil out of her. And when he walked up, you see, she's in this cell, and here's all the newspaper men, and there's the television cameras on, and here's the doctors, and a man's voice spoke up out of that woman and said, You can't cast me out! He said, Yes, I can, in the name of Jesus. And in his name, out you come. And the thing came out. But spoke up in a man's voice. I've heard it many times take on different types of voices. But you see, that's the demon activity. And so uh, he asked her, you see, well, and she said, yes, and mentioned several things that this spirit tried to get her to do. And she said, no, I, I just put my foot down and said, I'm not going to do it. said, well, did you ever do it? said, no, I didn't. said, when I, I wouldn't do it, he left me alone. Now that shows you that her willpower was still working in a case like that. Now, I want you to notice something here. I want you to see something here in this case. As I said, this man seems to be conscious of two principles within him. One of them was his own will fe feebly struggling, struggling for freedom, and the other was the evil spirits controlling him and crushing his will under theirs. Now, do you notice this? That it said when he was, the second verse, when he, that is Jesus, was come out of the ship, 
Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains. The chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him, and always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs crying and cutting himself with stone. Now notice, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. There's something in the man that still wanted to be free, wanted to be helped. A, a lot of times in dealing with some of these cases, my experience has been those who have willingly yielded to the devil don't want to be helped, and you can't help them. But those that are willing to be helped can be helped. Are you listening to me? Praise God forevermore. Now then, I want you to notice that the Lord met this man with deep compassion. You remember, that's what he told the man when the man wanted to go with him when he started to leave Jesus. He said, Suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. Now notice, And hath had compassion on thee. Hallelujah. So Jesus met him with deep compassion. You see, he, reg he regarded him as a victim of a power that he could not resist. And by a word of command, he set him free. Now immediately his whole appearance changed. He was wild. He was a maniac. He tore all of his clothes off of him. He cut himself with stones. He was crying night and day in the mountains. But here he is sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. Praise God. Now think about this thought. Think about the awful power that had possessed him. And that power was soon apparent in the destruction of those swine. Because it says here that these, uh, they besought Jesus. In fact, first of all, the one that possessed him cried with a loud voice, said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thy son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he, Jesus, said, or we should say had said unto him, Come out of the man, thy unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? He answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him. That's this one that possessed him and used his mouth, besought him, that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nine to the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding. Now notice, all the devils besought Jesus. All of them did. Saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into him. Now here's another thought. When they come to Jesus, the 15th verse, see, those that watched the swine, the herd of swine, ran into the city and told about what happened. The people came out, 15th verse, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. See, somebody said he was possessed with 2,000 devils. No, he wasn't. There's one devil possessed him. Only one had control of him. He permitted the others to come in. I'm going to get into some detailed teaching about that. I'm just setting it up for you to start tomorrow. Only one. See, that one used his voice. If you'd have been there, you'd have heard the man's voice say, don't send us away out of this country. Now, what about all the devils? Now, if you had to see Jesus anointed of the Holy Ghost, he had the operation of gifts of the Spirit. Among them, discerning of spirits, he was seeing into the realm of spirits. And he could hear all of them speak. All of them spoke up. That means the whole 2,000 of them spoke up. Legion of them, doesn't it? Said all of them did, doesn't it? said, don't send us away. Don't send us away out of this country. Only one of them could use the man's voice, the one that possessed him. Can you see that? But the thought I wanted to get over to you was this, the, the, the awful power that was in that man that was cast out of him into this herd of swine that caused him to run violent to destroy the whole herd. Now, of course, this man, you can see why he would. This man, after his deliverance, he, he clung to his deliverer. He desired to go with him. It besought him. Do you notice what that verse says? And when he's come to the ship, the 18th verse, he that had been possessed with the devil, again, did you notice he didn't say he'd been possessed with devils, with the devil, prayed him, or we would say besought him, or begged him, that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friend and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion 
on thee. So you can see that he wanted to cling to Jesus, and you can understand that, his deliverer. He desired to go with him. He desired to be with him. But Jesus knew that he needed to be pushed out into the discipline of confession and service. And so he sent him away at once to stand alone. Now you think about that. Stand alone. He was the only fellow over there in the land of the Gadarenes, the country of the Gadarenes that was witnessing for Jesus. To stand alone and spread the tidings in his home and town and country. Now why do you suppose Jesus sent him out immediately? Well, he knew this, first of all, that every new advance would give him new assurance and strength. It would help him. And then you'll notice that his testimony so stirred the country and the city, this town of Decapolis, that we read, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship into the other side, well, not here, but we read again another place, that when Jesus came back across there, after this man had spread and told what had done for him, that they accepted Jesus. And they ran out and got all their sick people and brought them together. If they might by any means touch him, and as many as he touched his clothes were made whole, every single one. All as a result of that one man's testimony. Praise God. So you see, it did something for the man to testify. It did something for the man to tell what had happened to him. And that's what Jesus told him. Go home to thy friends and tell them what great things the Lord's done for thee and have had compassion on you. And then I know that. God. Stand with it. Stand with it. Praise God. And I just never did hear from the other case. I'm, I, I believe personally that if I heard from that seventh case, I'd found out they were delivered too. Praise the Lord. And, and that's one reason of having these services here. It's a whole lot easier to deal with the devil on your ground than it is on his ground. Are you listening to me? Amen. Certainly is. Certainly is. You know, Jesus himself in ministry. Did you ever notice that sometime? On one occasion, you know, when he was come to Bethsaida, they bring a blind man to him, took the man by the hand, and led him out of the city before we ever ministered to him. Remember that? On another occasion, they bring a deaf man to him that had an impediment in his speech, besought him to put his hand on him. Now notice what he said. Jesus took the man by the hand and led him away from the multitude before he ministered to him. Now, on other occasions, he ministered right there in the multitude. But on this occasion, he led this man out of the city. On the other occasion, he led the man away from the multitude. I remember one time when Jesus appeared to me in a vision, I, I asked him how come him to do that. He said, because there's so much unbelief in the multitude. I led him away where I could minister to him. I can readily understand why Jesus on certain occasions put people out a time or two. I've had to put kin folks out of the room before you could get the people that was bed fast are sick, healed. Even though there's good people, it's too much unbelief. Too much unbelief. And if there's more unbelief, doubt there, than there is faith, then it's very difficult to deal with them. The one will overpower the other. Are you listening to me? See, the Bible said itself in Mark 6, 5 about Jesus and his ministry, and he, Jesus, could there in Nazareth do no mighty work. Didn't say he wouldn't, said he could. Isn't he anointed? With the Holy Ghost, power? Sure he is. Isn't he the divine son of God? Sure he is. Isn't he a man of faith and power? Sure he is. And yet Mark 6, 5 said, And he, he Jesus, could there in Nazareth do no matter. He didn't say he wouldn't, said he couldn't. Save, he laid his hands on a few. Few sick folk. Few folks with minor ailments, actually, the Greek says. Now the next verse says, And he marveled because of their unbelief. See, the unbelief of that city was so strong that it overcame such whatever faith he had, you see. And that's one reason of creating an atmosphere around here. You know, we got a good atmosphere created around here. Praise God that you can minister in. You still out there? Amen. Praise God forevermore. Now then, let's talk about it. I think this is a good time. I wanted to go over the ground that we had covered. But I think from this lesson, we saw it in others, but from this lesson particularly, that this is a good time again to go into some uh, detailed teaching about the devil and his work and his activity. Because, you see, he works in the area of, of 
physically oppressing people, mentally oppressing people, as well as spiritually oppressing people. And we need to know something about our enemy to be able to deal with him. And like I said to you, some folks said, well, I'm only going to talk about the devil. Well, if you can talk about him in the wrong way, but it's all right to talk about him in the right way. You know, I'm not going to make a wrong confession. You're not making a wrong confession. I mean, he exists. Whether you confess it or whether you don't, he still exists. Like those two fellows, see, they, they didn't want to make a wrong confession. They just want to sleep. God's going to take care of our axe handles, and he didn't. Hole handles, and shovel handles, and he didn't. Are you listening to me? Because their confession wasn't based on the Word of God. It's based on stupidity and ignorance. See? I mean, I mean, if there's a freeze coming, and if you want to save that flower, it's sitting out there, and it's a pot. Oh, well, no, no, my confession is God's going to take care of that. He won't let it freeze. No use of me getting up and getting it in. Well, just lay there and sleep, and it'll freeze. And if they said the freeze is coming, it's a coming, whether you believe or whether you don't. Are you listening to me? Have enough sense to prepare for it. So it's not a matter of making a wrong confession or negative confession. The devil exists. We need to know something about it. We need to know something about his activities. We need to know our authority and how to deal with it. Can you say amen? amen. And so... Let's go into a little discussion, detailed discussion about it. Let's turn back to the Old Testament and read some scripture. First of all, let's read from Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. Let's begin to read with the 13th verse. Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, instead of the 30th, 28th chapter. Begin to read with the 13th verse. And then read on down here through about the 19th verse. I think really to get a full full view of what he's saying here, that it would be interesting to start with the very first verse of this 28th chapter. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, now this is Ezekiel the prophet, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man. So he is a man, and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches, and hast gotten gold and silver into thine treasures. By thy great wonders, and by thy traffic, hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore will I bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defy thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Now Ezekiel's prophesying to the prince, which is a man of Tyrus. Now let's go on reading. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now he's not talking about a man now, is he? Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Ever precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire and emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. He's not talking about a man, is he? Who's he talking about? Notice the next verse. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast up on the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now notice, 
Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. Now he's talking about an angel, a being of the same caliber we would say of Michael, even greater, and Gabriel. But it seems that they had these cherubs and these archangels were different from others and it seems that they had a will of also because he was perfect. I said he was perfect. God said he was. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created. So he wasn't created evil. He's really talking about the devil here, Satan himself, you know, and Lucifer. He was perfect in his way until iniquity was found in him. Now here's another interesting thought. First, he took up this lamentation against the king, the prince of Tyrus. And you can see from reading that, that he's talking about the man, the man that ruled here in this realm. Then he took up this lamentation against the king of Tyrus. And you can see by reading after him that this is a spirit being. And he's called the king of Tyrus. Now, what do you mean by that? He's a reader of the one that's running it. You'll find all through the Old Testament this idea of a double kingdom. A kingdom that's seen upon the earth with a man ruling it. But above it, in the atmospheric heavens, another kingdom, you see, of demons and evil spirits that are actually ruling. And that's where much of the power of intercession comes in against those forces to keep them and hold them at bay. Now let's go on reading. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore will I cast thee out, the cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He goes on to tell you why and how he sinned. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. So you see, he was off up there in the heavens somewhere. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. I will bring thee to, an, to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. They that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Now he's speaking prophetically. He's still a terror. The time's coming when he'll never be any more. Let's turn back to Isaiah, the 14th chapter. I, I wish the Lord had seen fit to give us more, but God, the Holy Ghost, in his word, gave us what he wanted us to know. So at least we get some hints about these things. Now then, Notice what Isaiah is saying about the same being that Ezekiel was talking about. Let's start with the 12th verse of the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, now other, other scriptures said he was lifted up because of his beauty, now you can see where he sinned and when he sinned. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So he had some kind of a throne. He ruled. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, and that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Now he's talking about Lucifer, and he's talking about the fall of his kingdom, and he's talking about when he sinned. Same thing, actually, that uh, Ezekiel was talking about. 
Now I want you to turn back for just a moment with me to Genesis, the first chapter, and I want you to see something. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now notice the next verse. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now as you go on reading, everything God did was good. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. There's a vast amount of time happened between the first and second verse of Genesis 1. God did not create the world of without form or void. I want you to notice something. This Lucifer that he talks about here, same one that Ezekiel was talking about, said, notice, when he sinned, for thou hast said, I will ascend into the heaven. So he was below the heaven. I notice. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. But so he was below the stars in his throne and in his kingdom. I will sit also on the mountain of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So he was beneath the clouds, wasn't he? I'll be the, like the most high. I notice this. They that see thee shall now to look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms, that made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? You see, evidently, that whatever you think about it, it seems to me that the Bible, if it doesn't say so, it so strongly infers it that it's inescapable in your thinking that Satan evidently had some kind of kingdom here on the pre-Adamite earth another world here. Are you listening to me? And that he run it. Well, you see, that would explain where you prehistoric, as we call them, animals came from. They find the carcasses of them, but they're... See, that in the days of Noah, you got the same animals this side of Noah's flood as you had the other side. You got the same world. See, Peter says something about the world that then was. He's not talking about Noah's flood because the... the, the, the uh, Greek word translated world there means world system. And see, you've got the same world system this side of the flood that you had the other side of the flood. Same animals and, and same everything, so to speak. Are you listening to me? Now notice what Peter said in Second Peter, the third chapter. And I think you can see something here that may help you. may not. I don't know. If it doesn't, well, throw it away. No, don't throw it away. Hold on to it. Later on, it might be a blessing to you. Now notice here in 2 Peter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which, both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that thou shalt come in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. He's talking about from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and earth, which are now, are by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, he's not talking about Noah's flood. I said, did you hear me? He's not talking about Noah's flood because the world that was then perished. We've got the same animals this side of Noah's flood that they had. But, as you, the archaeologists dig, they find another world back there somewhere, you see. And they say the Bible's unscientific. No, the Bible tells you exactly what happened. That's where those dinosaurs were. Now, here's another thought. The Bible doesn't exactly say so, but actually it doesn't, it doesn't say not. Here's something that's very interesting. You see, that would tell you that, you see, evidently Lucifer, or Satan as we know him, we call him, 
And Ezekiel called him the king of Tyrus because he was really the power behind the throne running the thing. He originally had some kind of kingdom down here on the earth. There was some kind of a world here. I didn't say human beings. But then all of these evil spirits that are here could well be the spirits of those people or whatever they were. Well, when somebody said, no, they're angels that fell. No, the Bible said those angels that fell are kept in chains under darkness against the judgment of that day. Doesn't it? I said, doesn't it? They're bound right now. Those angels are. These were not angels. They were some kind of being. That could well mean why that those spirits are here. They've got a right to be here. Then did you notice something else that's very interesting? That explains something else to us. Why they gang up in certain, certain demons will gang up in certain parts of the country. Did you notice that these demons here said, don't send us away out of this country. Did you notice that? Did you notice that? They besought Jesus. All of them besought Jesus. Don't send us away out of this country. Didn't they? They wanted to stay there. Well, you see, evidently they were there way back there in that sort of their country. They want to stay there. I'm not just saying all oh, that's exactly fully the truth, but at least you get glimpses of such as you go. Now they notice. Notice that he said, This they willingly are ignorant that, the war, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. The, now, now notice this. From the beginning, of crea- the beginning of creation, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. All right, now let's go back to the beginning of creation. Let's go back here to Genesis now. In the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The whole thing was overcovered with waters. And yet Peter said, from the beginning of creation, they're willing to ignorant of this, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And yet Genesis 2 said, it was all covered with water. The whole thing was. All right, let's go back again to the 28th chapter of Isaiah. Let's go back again to Isaiah chapter 28 and read again. Or Isaiah 14 chapter, excuse me, not 20 chapter. Now notice. Notice when Satan sinned, what all he said he'd do is lift it up because of pride and beauty. Must have been down here on the earth because he said, I'll, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne. So he had a throne above the stars of God, so he's under the stars. I will sit also on the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, so he's beneath the clouds. This is when he fell, so it has to be way back there before Adam because when we get acquainted with him in the Garden of Eden, he's already a fallen being, isn't he? I said, isn't he? All right. I will ascend above the clouds. I'll be like the Most High. Now notice that, uh, that uh, 16th verse. They that see thee shall never look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness? See, that world, it was back there then because of his sin. That's the man. That's, that's the person. That's the individual. Satan. That uh, made the earth to tremble. That did shake symbol. Kingdom. That made the world as a wilderness. That destroyed the cities thereof. So God overthrew him. And overthrew that world that then was. You see, after the day of Noah, you still got the same world it was. Don't you? I said, don't you? you got every animal that was before the flood. Same world system. But you see, here you don't have that world system. Read this better way to say it, world system. Instead of saying world. Peter said, wasn't destroyed. Actually said it perished. Perished. We read it. Are you following me? Well, it'll give us some, you know, something to think about. Isn't it? So then... We get a, a view from the Old Testament, something about the fall of Satan. Let's look real quickly, and we'll have to close today, and then we'll pick up tomorrow on this very thought and go along. Into the New Testament. Let's notice here in the 12th chapter of Matthew, the 43rd through the 45th verses. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, 
He walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then saith he, then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now then, then the devil himself and evil spirits, as we know them, demons, evil spirits, are fallen beings. They are fallen beings. And they're here in this world. And evidently they have a right to be here until a certain time comes. Because you'll notice through these Gospels, on more than one occasion, when Jesus went to the synagogue, they were there, those there that were possessed with spirits, unclean spirits and so on, and they cried out with a loud voice and said, We know thee who thou art, thou holy one of God. Now notice, hast thou come to torment us before the time? Remember that? Remember that? Well, no, Jesus couldn't torment them, but he couldn't cast them out. The time to torment them hasn't come yet. But it will come, thank God. But he could cast them out of those people. They are fallen beings. They are spirits. They are personalities. Eternal personalities. They seek embodiment in man. You can see that in the story of this madman of Gadara. You can see that in this here when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Now notice that there are personalities. He said, See, a spirit's not just an influence. They are personalities, eternal personalities. Notice he could think. Notice he's outside that man. He's not in him anymore. But out there where he is, he can think. He can speak. He's a spirit. He's a personality. He said, he walked through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. A little side thought there, and I get abused with sometimes. You know, said when the unclean spirit's gone out of man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. I think about all the churches that are so dry. He's walking up and down the aisles there, can't find anything. He walketh through dry places. He walketh through dry places. (laughs) Amen. That's a little side thought. You can do whatever you want to with it. Now notice that he's walking. He's out, out of the man. The unclean spirit has gone out. He's out of the man. He's out of the person. Well, does he cease to exist? No, he's a personality. Now you see, you've got to come back to realize the whole realm of the spirit being. See, God is a spirit. He is an eternal personality, but he's also a divine personality. You see, God's a spirit. Jesus said, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The devil is a spirit. Now, he is an eternal spirit being, but he's not a divine spirit being. God is an eternal spirit being, but he's also a divine eternal spirit being. Angels are spirit beings. They are eternal spirit beings. The devil and demons... And evil spirits, as we call them, are spirit beings. They are eternal spirit beings. Man is a spirit being. He's made in the likeness and image of God, and God's a spirit, so he has to be. Man is a spirit being. He has a soul, and he lives in a body. We live in the realm of spirit beings. Something to think about. Jesus pre-existed with the Father from the beginning. In the beginning, John 1, 1 said, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And the 14th verse says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus was 
because he pre-existed with the Father from the beginning. If you read back there in Genesis, God said, let us, that's plural, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness, didn't he? Let us do it. And uh, Jesus then pre-existed with the Father. He was a divine, eternal spirit. But open the book of Hebrews, the Holy Ghost says through Paul that thou hast prepared him or made him a body. So we see the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and prepared a body for him. And he took on that body. And he became a divine human being. And then he made the new birth available to us so we were spirit beings and our spirit was estranged from God. The Bible calls it spiritual death. That don't mean it didn't exist. It means separated from God. So that our spirits could be brought back, reconciled, given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our spirits could be reborn and have the life of the nature of God in them. And now then we become human divine beings. That's a mouthful, isn't it? You, you chew on that a while. Don't try to swallow it till you chew it up real good. You may might choke you. Jesus was and is a divine human being. We are human divine beings. My spirit's born of God. Has a life in the nature of God in it, doesn't it? That's divine, isn't it? Now the devil and demons are eternal spirits, but not divine. But they are spirits. Now notice what it said here. When the, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, now the spirit's gone from him, gone out of him. But that spirit's a divine personality. He can still think, he can still talk. See, all of these spirits besought Jesus. They could, they're all talking, weren't they? In the spirit realm, you see, if you had had discerning of spirits, where you could see in the spirit realm, you could see them and hear them. See, that's not what that spiritual gift is, the ability to discern spirits. To discern means to see. It's seeing into the realm of spirits. Or we might put it this way, the world of spirits. Well, you see, Jesus lives over there in the realm of spirits. Yeah, he's got a, a body that is physical, that's flesh and bone. Not flesh and blood, but flesh and bone. Because he said, handle me. Spirit hath not flesh and bone. But yet, that spirit, but it's, uh, our body, it will be, 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 be planted, you know, a soulish body, but it's raised a spiritual body. So for that reason, you see, he could go right through the wall with the flesh and bone body. You know, when the door was shut, because the fear of the Jews and the disciples was in there, you remember? You remember that? And then he could ascend with that body up to heaven, out of their sight, went on up and they saw him. Or he can come back, and he will come back one of these days. But you see, very often over that realm, you see, when we come to visions, now, you see, if you are born again, spirit filled, and have the spirit of God, you, you see, God permits you sometimes to discern or see into the realm of spirits. It may come in vision form. Now, if you're outside the kingdom of God, like Cornelius, you see, was uh, not saved. He didn't know about Jesus. He was a Jewish proselyte. And an angel appeared to him. He saw an angel in his house. That's a demonstration of God's power. You see, God demonstrated his power, which he can do if he wants to. And this angel said, send to Joppa and inquire in the house of one Simon uh, Peter in the house of Simon the Tanner. For one Simon Peter, who in, who in he has come, will tell thee words whereby thy, thy house shall be saved. Praise God. And he got saved. Now, over there in that realm of spirits, you see, or a world of spirits, there is another world. We could call it a spirit world. There are evil spirits. And in your area of, of your, your spiritist, spiritualist, and much of your occult, you see, they're in contact with that other world. See, the human spirit is eternal, and, and not having been born again, it can develop spiritually the other way in, in, in great, in, in deep evil spirituality. Are you listening to me? Now you take down in, a, down in Texas as a minister. I preached for him. I had heard this. I had heard the story. You know, it was spread. Assembly of God preacher. But I was preaching in a meeting when he's 55 years old. Now this happened 20 years before when he's about 35. And I'd heard it. 
But I always like to, uh, many of these stories you hear, I like to get to the person that it happened to and then get first hand because they were right there. They ought to know what happened. Amen. Is that right? Just like you were here at this service this afternoon, you know, if somebody wants to know, they can ask you, you know, not the time it gets through two or three, it may be twisted or changed a little. See. Well, now this man is pastor of Assembly of God Church down in Texas. He had, he's about 35 years of age. And he's, well, he was 35. He and his wife had five children and when the fifth one was born, she had great difficulty and as was sick quite a while as a result of all the complications, so on, died. Went on to be with Jesus. Well, he had been trying to take care of kids. Of course, the church is a small church. They helped him as best they could. Now, I'm preaching a meeting for him in his church, another church he pastored, quite a large church, when he's 55 years old. So I asked him about it. He said, gave me first hand, and his church then, because, you know, he's gone through about 30 days of illness, you know, with his wife and so on. They said, why don't you just take a 30 days vacation, you know. Church will pay for it. We'll see after the children. Just, just leave. You know, go in where you want to go. Just get away from it for a while. 30 days. Now, you've got to realize that, see, I'm holding a meeting back there many years ago. And then you go on back 20 years before where you're back there in depression days when this happened. And he's, uh, he, so you did, you know, you travel by train, that's your main way of travel. So he bought a train ticket. First, he went inside, well, I've never been west. He'd go over and see the Rockies, you know, and maybe just, spend, you know, Rocky Mountains. He went to Denver first. And he was there in Denver, Colorado, put up the hotel downtown Denver there. And he's strange, he'd never been, really, I, think, I believe he told me he'd never been outside the state of Texas before in his life. And, and so Sunday afternoon, he's walking around, you know, he didn't know anybody, didn't know where to go to church or anything, or, you know, that night he hadn't been that morning anywhere. And he saw this sign. Uh, a lot of times churches in those days in full gospel, Pentecost church, and they still do some. You know, sometimes they just have a store building they have a church in or a mission, you know, or a theater. And in front of this theater, the sign just said, services here tonight at 7.30. That's all it said, services here tonight at 7.30. And he thought, well, man, that's not over two blocks from the hotel. I'll just, I'll just go to the service here. Don't know what it is, but I'll just go. So he said he is a little late getting in. And when he came in, at just uh, maybe two or three minutes past 7.30, the, the, the theater was full. It's lit. See, all the lights are on. It's lit. Just well lighted. All the seats were full. He got the last, you know, and of course they had, uh, you know, uh, theater seats, opera seats as we call them. You know, he got the last seat right by the door, right in the center aisle, right next to the back, and it's full. He hadn't got set down good. All the lights are on. Till the lights started going off. They started turning them off, you know. And only the platform is well illuminated. All he could see on the platform, no pulpit, was a baby grand piano. So he said, there, here came out a lady, all the lights on, a lady in a low-cut evening gown. Well, now, if you could imagine 1935, the Pentecostal church, brother, a low-cut evening gown just didn't sit well. <laughs> hey, hey, man. And here she came out and sat down at that piano. Well, the lights were dimmed on the platform, but they were still some light. But a spotlight's right on her. She's just right there in the light. And she sits down at that piano and begins to play Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock of Ages. She played through, you know, about one stanza. And he said, here came a fellow out of the wings in a tuxedo with a high top silk hat on. and stood here at the end of this baby ground, and another spotlight's right on him. Bright spotlight. There, there is other lights on the platform, but not real bright, you see. They had dimmed them. She, the lady continues to play. Rock of Ages, spotlight on her, spotlight on the man. The man pulls his high-top silk hat off, lays it, see, the piano's up like that, but he sets it here, it'll set there, you see. And he sings a verse, a stanza, and a chorus of Rock of Ages. Beautiful baritone voice. He said, I'm, I'm watching because you know this is astonishment to him. What is this? And he said, spotlight's on the woman. Spotlight's on the man. The spotlight's on her. But she disappears right in front of her eyes. She's gone. And the piano keeps on playing Rock of Ages. He keeps on singing Rock of Ages. He sings through another verse and stanza or on chorus of Rock of Ages. piano keeps on playing he walks down off the platform and there's nothing, enough light there walks down the aisle and this full gospel pastor said he came right up to me and said sir your wife died 30 days ago she did she's here I have a message for you from her 
No, he said, my wife did die 30 days ago, but she's not here. She went to be with Jesus. She's in heaven. And you don't have any message for me from her. See, they're in contact with spirits. There is an evil spirit that knew her when she was here. She would, uh, through this man, that evil spirit would have probably told him something that he knew nobody but his wife could have known. They do it. But yet, fellow full gospel ministers, I know we, we talked about it, you know. They said, well, you know a thing like that couldn't help you. Oh, you feel so sorry for people. Bless their heart. Those kind of people are prime targets for the devil to get. You can't just deny the existence of them, you know. They're going to be gone. The man said again to that pastor, Sir, your wife died 30 days ago. And she is here. And I have a message for you from her. Now you see, folks not grounded in the word, many of them that would swept them away because she did die. That's, that's supernatural revelation, isn't it? But it comes from the wrong source. Are you listening to me? He said, I said to him again, my wife did die 30 days ago, but she's not here and you don't have any message from her for me. She is with Jesus. She's a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and she's up in heaven with Jesus. The man said again, Sir, your wife died 30 days ago, and she is here, and I have a message for you from her. Now, you see, he was supernatural. led right down the aisle to that man. What he's saying to him is the truth. That's a supernatural manifestation, but it isn't divine. It's devilish. He said to me, I told the man the third time, my wife did die 30 days ago, but she's not here, and she doesn't have any message. You don't have any message for me from her. She's with Jesus in heaven. The man said, then you refuse to accept the message? He said, you don't have any message. I refused the whole thing. The man turned around and walked down the aisle. This minister told me, he said, I looked again, the spotlight's on the, the piano and the, and, and the seat there, and I, you can't see anybody, but the piano is still playing Rock of Ages, and I, get, I leave. Now, right on the other hand, you see dear Christian people are praying. I've had a vision. Sometimes their loved ones have appeared to them in a vision that was divinely supernatural. Amen. Are you listening to me? See, there is a difference, a vast difference between the two, yet both of them are real. Those evil spirits operate through those people. You see, that, that spirit could have told that man something. See, and that's where many are carried away. Because that spirit observed that woman in life when she was alive. And he knows things that were said and done. Are you listening to him? And, and he'll, uh, he could have told something. Many people have been swept away. said, well, now I know. That has to, my, the spirit of my wife must be here. Because I know that's something that only the two of us knew. Her spirit must be here. But no, that's that evil spirit. Familiar spirit that were familiar with them and knew in life something about them. I remember I went in one time, a fellow was, I was holding a meeting in a certain place down in Texas, and, and one of the deacons of the church, he had a son that was, oh, well, I don't know, I, I think maybe because of physical condition that he'd drink, trying to get away from it, and take dope, one thing or another, and, then, and, and couldn't get away from it. Then he wasn't saved, he's a grown man now, and he's, he's I guess, 42, 3 years old, never married. But he'd, he'd have something like epileptic seizures or something, you know. And he'd, he'd go into these fits, and, and, and then sometimes he'd just, just go raging, just tear up furniture. And, and I was only about two blocks away in a hotel, motel. And, and so he called, brother, the brother called and said, Brother Hagin, would you come, you know, around here? The pastor was not, not in town. And he said, would you, uh, you know, this, this son really didn't make his home with him, but he'd come back there, and, and, and he, we got him back here in the den. And, and uh, I said, well, I'll just run around. I ran around there. Now, he was sort of out of it, sort of like he's in a trance or a coma or something. You know, and, and, and when I, the minute I walked in, out of his mouth, these words, I saw you, I know you, I know who you are, I saw you last Monday when you came into town. 
You, he told me exactly every street I drove down, exactly. How did he know that? Well, he didn't know that. That foul devil saw me when I come into town. In the spirit world, he was observing me. He told me the, how I came in, the highway I came in. And many highways came into that city, about 100,000 people. Many highways came in. He told me the highway I came in. He told me the street. I saw you, he said, when you turn. And he told me the next street I went down. And I said to him, to the spirit, not to the man. Man didn't know what was going on. Yeah, I know you saw me, you dumb spirit. Shut up. Now, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave the man. And he fell backwards on the couch like, he's, like that fellow. Jesus cast the devil out of him. It looked like he's dead there for a minute or two. You know, all life was gone from him, but it rose up all right. Now, see, that devil saw you. Angels are here. Don't you believe that? Yeah. Don't the Bible teach so? I said, does the Bible teach so? Angels are ministering. Well, they're spirits. They observe us. They're here when we come to church. Jesus, you know, talked about little children and said their angel is ever before my father's. But they ain't. They have an angel. Well, those demons and evil spirits are here too. But they know when you're afraid of them and when you're not. They know what you know. That's the reason that devil in that fellow that was possessed spoke up to those seven sons of Siva and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? You've got no authority. Thank God we have authority. Well, I'm sorry that I, I got carried away. That time just went on and on and on, didn't it? Let's stand up, everybody. Praise God.